People who are destined for great success in the future are willing to make sacrifices in the present to ensure that future. By sacrifices, we mean they are willing to put in long hours, get up earlier, work harder, and stay later. They're willing to invest and save their money, even though they don't have a lot, knowing that with compound interest, it will grow over time. They're willing to spend an enormous amount of time investing in their children, knowing that this investment in their children, in time, love, affection, and support, will pay off for decades and generations, even into the lives of their children and grandchildren. So, sacrifice is the critical word, and sacrifice means that you have the ability to discipline yourself, to delay gratification in the short term, so that you can enjoy far greater rewards in the long term. We say that self-discipline is self-control. It's self-mastery. Now the payoff for practicing self-discipline is immediate. People might think, well geez, you know, I get these rewards weighed down in the future. No, no, there is an immediate reward. There's a wonderful line in spiritual development that said, you are not punished for your sins but by them. In other words, there are things that you do that are harmful to you, that cause immediate detriment, but you're also rewarded for the good things that you do, and you're rewarded immediately. So what we know is, when you practice self-discipline, you actually like and respect yourself more. And you know, and I know, that how you feel about yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Do you feel that you're a good person? Do you feel that you're a likable person? A successful person? The more you like yourself and respect yourself and value yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, the better is your attitude, the better is your reaction to other people. You just feel happy inside. And wonderfully enough, when you practice self-discipline, when you exert yourself to do what you know you should do, even though there's endless temptations to do something fun and easy, when you discipline yourself to do it, your self-esteem goes up. You actually like yourself more. Your self-image improves. You actually see yourself as a better person. And of course, as you know, your self-image determines your performance. The person you see in your mind will be the person that you will be on the outside. And the wonderful thing is, when you practice self-discipline, especially in exercise for example, but even in hard work, your brain releases endorphins. Endorphins are called nature's happy drug, and it actually makes you happy to practice self-discipline, to take control of yourself, and make yourself do the right thing and complete it. You feel good about yourself at the moment. And of course, the effect that it has on your future can be tremendous. Fortunately, Self-discipline is a habit that you can learn with practice and repetition. If you do something over and over again, you eventually develop a habit. The difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is that successful people have success habits. And the most important success habit they have is the ability to make themselves do what they know they should do at this time. And wonderfully enough, if you practice it over and over again, it finally locks in. Now many people get into the habit of taking the easy way out, looking for shortcuts, and so on. So they actually get into a comfort zone of doing things that are harmful to their long-term future. And they actually feel uncomfortable completing tasks or starting on their most important jobs. However, when you get into a new comfort zone, it will be easier for you to practice the habit of self-discipline than it would be in the past for you to take the shortcut. As the German philosopher said, everything is hard before it's easy. Everything is hard before it's easy. So developing the habit of self-discipline is hard. And be patient with yourself because you'll slip back all the time. All your life, you'll be slipping back. All your life, you have to fight this battle. You never get it to the point where it's locked in forever. Every morning you get up, and that alarm goes off, and you say, Do I sleep a little longer, or do I get up? You know, every time you look at a list of things to do, you say, Do I start with the most important thing? As they say, Do the worst first. Or do I do something that's fun and talk to a friend or make a phone call? You've got to fight this battle every single day. But every time you fight it, you feel better about yourself. It only takes about 21 days, they say, to develop a new habit. So you can lock in the foundation of the habit simply by practicing self-discipline every single day, without exception for 21 days. Some years ago, a businessman named Herbert Gray did a long-time study. It was kind of his project to find out what he called the common denominator of success. What would be the common denominator of success? And he spent 11 years studying the literature, interviewing people, reflecting on it, and he finally wrote a little pamphlet. And the pamphlet has been handed around for years and years. And you don't need to get it because I'll tell you what he said. 
The common denominator of success was quite simple. He said successful people he found make a habit of doing what unsuccessful people don't like to do. And of course the logical question is, well, what is it that unsuccessful people don't like to do? Well it turned out to be the same thing that successful people don't like to do either. But they do it anyway, because they recognize that that's the price of success. For simple things like exercising, going for a run or a walk at the end of the day, well, do people like to do this? Do we look forward to exertion and perspiration and sweating and strain and everything else? No, we don't look forward to it. But we do it because we recognize that this is the price of looking and feeling fit, trim, living a long life, taking good care of our bodies, and so on. So remember, the same things that unsuccessful people don't like to do, are things you don't like to do either. Many years ago, I met Rich DeVos personally. You know, Rich DeVos is the founder of Amway, started off selling soap from door to door, and now he's worth about $5.3 billion, according to Forbes. And he was asked a question. He said, Well, you know, how do you get over the fact that it's hard to prospect? It's hard to recruit. It's hard to build a business. It's hard to come home after work and work on building your business. He said, You just have to understand this. There's lots of things in life that you don't like to do, and you'll never like to do them. There's lots of hard things that contain stress, and they contain rejection, and potential failure, and hard work, and so on. He said, but you do them because you want to do the other things. It is only by doing the things that you don't want to do, that you can finally create the opportunity to do all the things that you want to do for yourself and your family. And again, it comes back to our favorite word, sacrifice. Being willing to pay the price in the present to enjoy the great rewards in the future. Now there are nine disciplines that you can develop that we'll talk about today. Disciplines that will improve every area of your life. And here's a rule. Every exercise of discipline in any area, strengthens disciplines in every other area. Just as if you work out with your full body, that strengthens all your muscles, your heart, your lungs, and so on. Every weakness and discipline also weakens your other disciplines as well. So every time you exert yourself to discipline yourself, to make yourself do something, to control and master your natural tendency to seek the line of least resistance. Every time you master that tendency, you feel stronger and better, and you strengthen your ability to discipline yourself in other areas as well. So the first discipline of all is the discipline of clear thinking versus fuzzy thinking. You know sometimes you've heard me ask, what is the highest paid work in America? What's the most important work in any job or any company? And the answer is thinking. And you know the old saying, that some people think, some people think they think, and the great majority would rather die than think. But the discipline of clear thinking is the most important, because the way you think, the quality of your thinking, determines the quality of your decisions and choices. Your decisions and choices determine the actions you take. The actions you take determine your results. And your results determine the quality of your life. And it all starts with your thinking clearly. Thomas Edison once said that thinking is the hardest discipline of all. It requires real effort to think. Because especially today, we are so surrounded with distractions. I'm always amazed when I go down the street or fly or drive, as people seem totally immersed in listening to things. They've got devices in their ears and stuff on their cell phone. They're listening to music in their car and they're watching television. They simply cannot stop bombarding their mind with sensory input. And of course, when you're doing that, it is impossible for you to think. To think well requires that you practice a couple of techniques. Now first of all, as Peter Drucker said, you need to take time to think. You need to create long, unbroken chunks of time. The rule is that fast decisions are usually wrong decisions especially fast decisions involving people or money. So if you're going to make a decision that has long-term consequences, then you have to give it a lot of thought. You have to sort of look at it like a beautiful piece of porcelain. You look at it from every single side and think about it carefully. And the more carefully you think about a decision, the better the quality of that decision will be when you finally make it. How many times have you said, you know, if I just thought about that a little bit more, I wouldn't have done it, or if I just thought a bit better or I just taken time to think. Well, superior people, through experience and through painful experience, learn to take their time in making important decisions. So one of the very best ways that you can develop the discipline of clear thinking is to sit in solitude for 30 to 60 minutes when you have a major problem or major issue in your life. 
Solitude has been discovered and rediscovered throughout all the history of man as the most powerful of all thinking tools. You see, if you could imagine a bucket of water with silt in it and it's all churned up and you can't see anything, but if you leave the bucket of water to sit for a while, all the silt will drop to the bottom and the water will become perfectly clear. This is what happens for you in solitude. You sit calmly by yourself with no noise, no distractions, nothing to read, just sit quietly, which takes tremendous discipline the first few times you do it. At about 20 or 26 minutes, your mind goes clear, and any problem that you've been working on, the solution just pops into your mind. Any issue you've been dealing with, the answer just comes to you. It's almost like a miracle. When you practice solitude, you actually activate your superconscious mind and your intuition, and something that you've been having trouble with or wrestling with suddenly becomes clear, and you know exactly what to do. Now here's the wonderful thing about solitude. Everybody who practices it will tell you it's incredible. And if you've never done it before, just practice it once sometime today. Take 25-30 minutes, take an hour if you can, and just sit quietly by yourself and allow your mind to calm. Sometimes it's called mind calming, and just allow yourself to calm down and think, and the most amazing things will happen. You'll start to make better decisions. You'll start to hear what is called the still small voice within, and this small voice or sometimes it will shout at you so loudly you will be amazed. Now here's another way to think better. When you're dealing with any kind of a situation, write down every detail of the problem or situation. Take a sheet of paper. And the rule is, think on paper. Think on paper and write down every detail. How it happened, what's going on, the problems, the concerns, the cost, who's involved, just write it down, write it down, write it down. And the most amazing thing happens between the head and the hand as you're writing out all the details. Sometimes exactly the right choice pops out at you. It becomes clear. But you would not have triggered that superconscious solution if you hadn't taken the time to think on paper. You know, Aristotle once said that wisdom, which is the greatest of all human desires, wisdom is the ability to make good decisions, is a combination of experience plus reflection. Experience plus reflection. In other words, you have an experience, and then you reflect on the experience and you think about what that experience means to me. How can I use that? What can I learn from it? So, reflecting on your experiences, the best way to do that is to go for a walk. Just go in for a walk where you can't listen to anything, don't take an iPod or anything, just go for a walk, 30 or 60 minutes, and just walk, and while you're walking, reflect upon something that's going on at work or at home. You'll be amazed at the quality of ideas that will come into your mind to improve your thinking. Talk it over with someone else who you like and trust, and give them the details and ask them to give you their feedback. Give you their perspective. Sometimes, if you're in a great relationship, the other person can give you a perspective that completely changes your ideas. A good way to think better is to ask, especially if you're frustrated or having difficulties, to ask, what are my assumptions? What am I assuming about the situation that may not be correct? What if my basic assumptions about this relationship, about this job, about this product or service or this investment were wrong? Then what would I do? And here's the key to good thinking. Be open to doing something completely different. Be open to admitting the possibility that you could be wrong and doing something completely different. And what that does is it opens up your mind and your perspective so you can see all kinds of possibilities that you may not have seen before. So clear thinking is the first discipline. It is the discipline practiced by the most successful, happiest, and wealthiest people in our society. Now the second major discipline, my old friend, is the discipline of daily goal setting. The discipline of daily goal setting will change your life. Why? Because what we know is that focus and concentration are essential to success. There are some skills that are helpful to success, but focus and concentration are indispensable. If you cannot focus and you cannot concentrate, then you have to work for someone else who will make you focus and concentrate. They will supervise you. The ability to focus, to be clear about what you want, and then to concentrate single-mindedly on achieving it, are both habits or disciplines that you can learn through practice. So, you start off with the discipline of daily goal setting. You start off and you ask this question. This is the big question. What do I really want to do with my life? Why am I here? If I could do anything at all, what would I want to do with my life? And there's a great question that you can use to clarify this. Most people think in a very fuzzy way about what they want to do with their life, because they're preoccupied with all of their problems in life. So, 
What you do is you remove all your problems by asking yourself this question. Imagine that I receive $10 million cash today, tax-free, in the bank. But at the same time I got a diagnosis from the doctor that said that you're going to die in 10 years. You'll have superb physical health for 10 years, but you're going to die in 10 years. So, if you had $10 million in the bank, which means you had no financial worries, and you had 10 years to live, what would you really want to do with your life? What would you do more of or less of? What would you start up, or what would you stop completely? What would you get into, or get out of? If you had 10 million in 10 years to live, imagine that for the moment. Because most people, again, as I said, become preoccupied with their limitations, with what they don't have, and it holds them back from deciding what they really, really want. Now the next thing you do is take a spiral notebook. And I carry a spiral notebook around with me all the time. Take a spiral notebook and write down 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months or so. Write your goals in the present tense as though they already existed. Don't say, I will earn X number of dollars in the next 12 months. Write them down as though you are already earning it. Say, I earn X number of dollars this year. I always write the words buy at the end of every goal. I will earn X number of dollars by December 31st, 2021. I achieve this goal by June 30th, 2022, and so on. When you give your subconscious mind a deadline, it works on it 24 hours a day. When you write down a goal, make sure it's positive. Don't say, I will quit smoking. Say, I am a non-smoker. Don't say, I will lose weight by weighing X number of pounds. And when you give your subconscious mind a command in the present tense that is contrary to your current situation, your subconscious mind goes to work to resolve this dynamic tension and make your external reality consistent with your new orders, your new commands, just your new goals. And finally, always write your goals in the personal tense. Use the word I, because only you, in the whole universe can use the word I relative to yourself. You say, I earn, I drive, I achieve, I acquire, I accumulate, I live in. In other words, always follow the word I, plus an action verb. Then you take a spiral notebook, and you write down at least 10 goals you can work on, 10 to 15 goals at a time, but never less than 10. Your subconscious and superconscious minds have incredible power, so give them lots of stuff to work on. And then what you do is every single day, you write down and rewrite your goals. Every single day, you take out your spiral notebook, and write down your goals once more. And I do this every morning before I start off. I plan my day, and then I write out my 10 goals every morning. Before you start out, you reprogram your subconscious mind, and then start your day. I promise to you this. If you will do this for one month, actually 21 days is good enough, your whole life will change. You'll see changes that are astonishing. People come up to me at every single seminar and say, it was incredible. I started to write my goals every day. I accomplished eight of them in six months, five in a week, most of them within 12 months. It's transformed my life. So. All I ask you to do if you're not already doing it, is to give it a try. Now the third discipline is the discipline of daily time management. And of course we know that the rule is that every minute spent in planning saves 10 minutes in execution. So disciplining yourself to plan your days thoroughly before you begin, will save you at least 10 minutes for every minute you spend in planning. And according to the research, it will increase your productivity by 25 to 50 percent, maybe even double your productivity. For every day that you plan, you see, if you're not working from a plan, then you just respond and react to whatever is going on. Somebody comes in, phone rings, it's an interruption or a problem, and you're off and running. But if you have a plan, you just keep working on the plan, it gives you a track to run on. So, begin the discipline of daily time management by making a list. Start off with a sheet of paper again, think on paper, and write down everything you have to do in the course of the day. The very best time to make this list is the night before. If you do this, then your subconscious mind works on your plan all night long, and you often wake up in the morning with great ideas to implement your plan. Then, you organize your list by priority before you begin. You don't just jump into it. Use the 80-20 rule that says that 20% of the items on your list will account for 80% of the value, which are the most valuable. This is the hardest of all disciplines to learn. It's the essence of my teaching worldwide. It is the key to supercharging the quality of your life and your results. If you can start every morning with a list organized by priority, and start on your number one task, and stay with it till it's done, 
You will supercharge your life. You will release endorphins in your brain that cause you to agree. You will motivate yourself and energize yourself and propel yourself into all your other tasks. You'll get twice as much done on any day where you start and complete your major task first than any other day. The discipline of time management will then spread to all your other disciplines when you can demonstrate each morning that you have the self-control, self-mastery, and self-discipline to start and complete your most important tasks. You just feel fabulous about yourself. Now the fourth discipline is the discipline of courage. And it goes back to what we said earlier. Force yourself to do what you know you should do, especially in the area of courage. The biggest obstacle to success, in my estimation, the estimation of psychologists, is the fear of failure. It's the fear that it won't work out. It's the fear of loss of time or money or emotion. It's fear that goes back to early childhood. And the only way we can succeed is by overcoming this fear. And this fear is captured in the words, I can't. I can't. What about this? What about that? What about this? Fully 80% of the population is paralyzed by the fear of making a mistake. And why? Because in growing up, you make lots of mistakes and don't like the feel of it. So, eventually you become conditioned to avoid taking any risk at all. So you have to overcome this in order to realize your potential. But what we know is that courage, the courage to face fears, is a habit, and its development is a practice just like typing with a typewriter or riding a bicycle. You can actually develop the habit of courage by practicing courage whenever it's required. Aristotle wrote about this in his Nicomachean Ethics in 350 BC. He said, If you desire to have a quality that you don't have, act in every instance where the quality is called for, as though you already had it, and you will have it. So, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do the thing you fear, and the death of fear is certain. What he said was to confront your fears. The natural human tendency is to avoid a fear-causing or fear-inducing situation. Most of our fear problems seem to be bundled up with other people. By the way, it's confronting a boss. It's confronting a bad relationship. Sometimes it's confronting a prospect. Cold calling, going out and calling on customers, and facing rejection, failure, and embarrassment, and so on. But confronting that fear instead of avoiding it, just do it. So, the reason you want to confront your fears is not because of the incident specifically, it's because of what it does for your character. You want to demonstrate to yourself that you can face down a fear, look it square in the eye, and suddenly, surprise, surprise, it goes away. And you realize that the fear was in your own mind. Now, here's the most wonderful thing about overcoming fears. If the fear of failure is summarized with the feeling, I can't, psychologists have found you can actually short-circuit or override the fear by saying to yourself very strongly, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, and do it, and do it. If you're afraid of anything, talking to somebody, confronting someone, dealing with something, say to yourself over and over again, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, and then just do it. And you'll be amazed. The fear disappears, almost like poof, it's gone. So, the key is, you're looking at that telephone to pick up the phone to cold call to prospect. Just say to yourself, I could do it, I could do it, I can do it, and pick it up and dial, and suddenly, the fear disappears. And you do this repeatedly, and eventually, you develop the habit of courage. Here's an exercise for you. Identify one fear situation in your life today, and use that as your challenge. Use that as your test case. You say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to face this fear down. I'm going to hammer it. I'm going to smash it. I'm going to look at it directly, head on, like a car hitting a wall, until the fear is gone. And once you've done that, you'll look up, and you'll be a different person for the rest of your life. You'll know that nothing that you're afraid of can stop you. The fifth discipline is the discipline of excellent health habits. Your goal should be to live to be 100 in sound physical health. Today, the average lifespan in America is approaching 80, which means 50% of people will die above that, and 50% of people will die below. Since you are smarter than the average or more knowledgeable, you're better informed. You're probably going to smash that average and live to be 90, 95, 100 years old. So, set 100 as your goal and say to yourself, Okay, I want to live to be 100 in great shape. What would I have to do? What kind of shape would I have to be? And what kind of life would I have to live physically in order to get there? First of all, design your ideal body. If your ideal body was perfect, in other words, weight, fitness, tone, stretch, 
flexibility, and everything. If your body was perfect, what would it look like? And make a list of all the things. Remember, when you were a child, your body was perfect. And if your body is not perfect now, it just means that maybe you've forgotten to do a few things, or you've done a few things you shouldn't have done. So, start off with a clear picture of your perfect body, and recognize that that is possible. Now the key to physical health has always been contained in the five-word formula. Eat less and exercise more. Eat less and exercise more. Every single person who studies the subject, and now more and more people realize that the key to success is to eat less and exercise more and exercise every day. So, discipline yourself to exercise daily. The very best time, of course, is in the morning. If you get up in the morning and exercise immediately, even if it's just stretching or going for a walk or riding a life cycle or walking on a treadmill, doesn't matter what it is. If you get up in the morning and exercise immediately, not only will your body continue to burn calories all day, not only will you be more alert because you'll have highly oxygenated blood flooding your brain first thing in the morning, but you'll develop the discipline of starting on something that you would normally not want to do and getting it done, getting it out of the way. The more times I read about wealthy people, successful people, and top business people, it's amazing how many of them get up at five and work out for an hour. It's absolutely astonishing. Over and over again, you see their daily routine, as they get up at 5 or 5.30, and they work out for an hour before they start planning and organizing their day. If you can discipline yourself to do that, it'll have an enormous impact on your life. Also, when you exercise first thing in the morning for 30 to 60 minutes, your brain releases endorphins which, as I said, make you happy. They make you feel exhilarated, make you feel more creative, more positive. You'll feel more personable, you're more eager to get to work and so on. So, morning exercise just starts you off in fantastic mental and physical condition. Now to get rid of any extra weight that you might have, just eliminate the three white poisons. The three white poisons are anything that has flour in it. Flour, wheat flour, any kind of flour makes you overweight. It sticks to your gut, to your hips, and to your thighs. Eliminate sugar and any sugar, eliminate desserts, eliminate donuts, Eliminate soft drinks. Don't eat things with sugar. And eliminate salt. Don't put any salt on your food. There's plenty of salt in everything you do. I ran into a friend of mine recently who lost 20 pounds. I looked at him. He was just swaying. I mean, his suit jacket was swaying back and forth like a tent on a tent peg in the wind. I said, Geez, I said you've lost a lot of weight. I said, How did you do it? He said, I tried everything. I exercised. He said, I walked, I tried everything. He said, I finally stopped eating anything white. I stopped eating flour food, sugar and salt. I dropped 22 pounds in 60 days. I never came back. And I've had people tell me that all over the world. So if you can discipline yourself to only eat fruits, vegetables and proteins, no pasta, no bread, no rolls, no cakes, no desserts, no coke, no colas, and no salt. If you can just do that, you'll see yourself losing weight from the first day. Some people will lose three or four pounds in the first week that they stop adding salt to anything. And then of course drink lots of water. Drink eight glasses of water a day. And what that does, it washes all the impurities out of your system. Very simple process, eat more salads. And here's a real key. Eat before 6 5 p.m. at night. Eat light and eat before 6 o'clock p.m. Everything you eat after 6 o'clock p.m., you accumulate. Everything you eat before 6 o'clock p.m. burns up before you go to bed. Don't eat within 3 hours of going to bed. Eat a light or medium light dinner, salad with a little bit of protein, before 6 o'clock p.m. or at 6 o'clock p.m. and you'll be astonished the next morning, you'll be thinner. It's absolutely remarkable. Two more things by the way, with regard to health. First of all, get regular medical and dental checkups. People often don't go to the dentist or the doctor until they need to. I find that it's a false economy. Especially if you're over 40, you should have a complete medical every single year, and you should have regular dental checkups at least twice a year. If you're in business of any kind, you should have four visits to the orthodontist to clean your teeth every single year so that your teeth are really clean. They found there's a direct relationship between gum health and the health of your whole body. So, with regard to self-discipline, just remember the Michael Jordan motto, just do it. If you think it's a good idea, do it. Get on with it. Don't waste time, don't make excuses. Now the sixth discipline is the discipline of regular saving and investing. 
One of the greatest goals that we have in life is to be financially independent. One of the greatest worries we have in life are our bills and our debts. The greatest fear we have in life is poverty or ending up with no money. So the very act of starting to provide for yourself financially transforms your thinking about yourself and your life. It makes you a happier person. So, set a goal of financial independence. Decide that, by gum, I'm going to become financially independent and resolve to get out of debt and stay out of debt. I've worked with countless people who have become financially independent starting from nothing, and one of the things they had was an aversion to debt. They hated debt. They avoided debt like the plague. The only debt they would accept maybe was debt on a mortgage on the house that they live in, maybe debt on a car. But even then, they didn't like debt. Other than that, they avoided debt like the plague. So, to get out of debt and stay out of debt, you have to discipline yourself. Now, here's an interesting point. And I learned this from one of the smartest money managers I ever met. He said, when we're young, we associate money with pleasure. We get our first allowance, and we go and we spend it on candy. And we think that when we have money, we go and we spend it on candy or things that make us feel good. Now when we become adults, whenever we think of getting a lot of money, our first thought is spending it on something that makes us happy. If you go to a tourist resort where people are on vacation and having a good time, there are just lines of knickknacks and gadgets and junk because people, when they're happy, associate going out and buying stuff. However, what this does is it keeps you broke all your life. So, what you do, this is what he told me, is you rewire yourself. You kind of pull out one wire and replug it in, and you say, instead of saying I like spending money, you say I like saving money. And you begin to think of how much you enjoy having money in the bank, how much you enjoy saving, how much you enjoy delayed gratification, how much you enjoy the idea of moving toward financial independence. And when you develop the habit of being happy about saving money, you start to find yourself more and more careful with your expenditures. Now you know the rule for financial independence is to save 10, 15, 20% of your income throughout your life. And as your income grows, keep saving more and more and investing it, putting it away. As Albert Einstein said, compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. So, putting your money away in well-chosen mutual funds, money market funds, index funds, just letting it grow over time. And don't worry about the stock market going up and down. The average increase in the U.S. stock market for the last 100 years has been 8 to 10% each year, taking good years and bad years into consideration. So, your job is to save 10, 15, 20% of your income. Now for most people, because they're in debt, they just discard that completely. Their mind shuts down. So, here's what I say. Develop the habit of saving 1% of your income. If you make $2,000 a month, that means you save $20. You go down to the bank and you open up a financial freedom account and you put in $20 from the first paycheck you get that month. And then you discipline yourself to live on the other 99%. Once you're comfortable living on 99%, then you increase it to 2% and 3% and 4%. Within a year, you'll have developed the habit of living on 85 to 90% of your income and automatically saving the balance. You can even have the amount deducted from your paycheck so it disappears and you never see it. Your paycheck goes into the bank, and the amount is automatically deducted into your savings account, or into an investment account. Soon, you develop the habit of living on less than you earn, and you've changed your thinking from, I enjoy spending, to I enjoy saving. A key way to save your money is to delay, and to defer major purchase decisions. You'll find that if you think about buying a car, or a washing machine, or a stereo set, or a new computer, if you think about it for 30 days, in many cases, you won't do it at all. Or if you do, you'll make a better decision. One of the smartest things of all is to buy things that are used rather than things that are new. You know that millionaires never buy new cars. Millionaires never buy new cars. According to the studies by Stanley and Dano in The Millionaire Next Door, if they wait and they buy a car that's two years old, it's coming off lease or that's been driven for two years and somebody's trading it in, and it's still under warranty for three years. And you can even get extended warranties on many cars where they'll go back and clean it all up and give you another five years on a two-year-old car. But what have you done? You save ten or twenty thousand dollars on a car. And what do you do with that money? You put it away and let it grow with compound interest. If all you did was buy a used car every five to eight years, drive it until it falls apart, and then buy another one, the money saved from buying new cars can make you rich. It can accumulate with compound interest into hundreds of thousands of dollars by the end of your working lifetime. 
If you're going to invest, the rule is to investigate before you invest. My friend Ken Pfizer of Pfizer Investment says that two-thirds of all investing is avoiding making mistakes. Let me repeat that. Two-thirds of all success in investing or business is avoiding making mistakes, either by making the wrong decisions or by making decisions too quickly. So, if you're going to invest in anything, the rule is to spend as much time investigating the investment as you spent making the money. You'll find that quick investment decisions are invariably poor investment decisions. Invest only in things that you know and understand. Don't invest in somebody else's idea, scheme, or business. Only invest in things that you know. The number one rule is don't lose money. Whatever you do, don't lose money. If there's a possibility of losing a little bit of money and you do it, you're probably going to lose a lot. So, be very careful. Once you earn the money, hold on to it. There's a Japanese proverb that says, making money is like digging in the sand with a pin. Losing money is like pouring water on the sand. It's easy to lose money, but it's hard to make it and keep it, and it's the most important discipline of all. Another discipline is to pay cash as often as possible, and for as much as possible. Get rid of all your credit cards except for one, and only use that one when you have to. The very act of paying cash hypersensitizes you to how much it's costing, and causes you to spend less money. W. Clement Stone once said, If you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. The primary reason why you save your money and accumulate it carefully is because it gives you two things. First of all, it gives you freedom. You know you've got money in the bank. If you don't like your job, you can walk away from it because you've got money in the bank. But the second thing it gives you is opportunity. If an opportunity comes along, you're prepared to take advantage of it. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, I don't have any money, I can't afford it, I'm broke. And people just shake their head in pity and walk away. As an adult, you should always have opportunity money put aside. And when you have it, you feel great about yourself. The difference between a person with a little money and a person with no money is night and day. A person with a little money feels great. A person with no money always feels inferior, anxious, worried, concerned, irritable, short-tempered. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now the seventh discipline is the discipline of hard work. There's nothing that will help you more than for you to develop a reputation as a hard worker. In the studies of self-made millionaires they said, I didn't have better education, better talent, better knowledge, but I was willing to work harder than anyone else. Most self-made millionaires work 60 and 70 hours per week for 5, 10, 15 years before they break through. Most other people are trying to get by on 5 days a week, and then during those 5 days a week, they don't work very hard at all. The interesting thing, Thomas Jefferson once said, Do you believe in luck? He was asked. He said, Yes. He said, I believe in luck. He said, And the harder I work, the more that I have. So the harder you work, the luckier you get. The harder you work, the more opportunities you have, the more doors open up to you, the more opportunities you see. So, in America, the average work week is 32 hours, as you know. In France legally, the average work week is 35 hours, but then most people waste about half their time at work. According to Robert Half International, the average person wastes 50% of their time in idle chit-chat with co-workers, coffee breaks, lunches, reading the paper, surfing the internet doing all kinds of things that don't contribute anything to the work. Here's the rule that will make you successful, happy, and rich. Work all of the time. Work when you go to work, put your head down, and go to work. Don't waste a single minute. Put your head down, and work all day long. If somebody comes up to you and says, Hi, how are you doing? You say, Fine. But right now, I've got to get back to work, back to work, back to work. If you've got a minute to chat, yes, but not now. Let's talk after work. Right now, I've got to get my job done, and nobody will ever stop you when you say, I've got to get back to work, I've got a job, I've got to get out, I've got something I have to get done. They'll go away and ruin someone else's career. Remember, the greatest time wasters in the world of work are other people who take up your time with idle chit-chat and worthless gossip. You've got to avoid the time wasters in every single company. These people go around and they're like a virus. They go around and they infect everybody they talk to. Stay away from time wasters. Now here's a way to double your productivity, performance, output, and income. Here's a way to put yourself on the fast track, increase your income, and become one of the most valuable people in your industry. 
Start one hour earlier, and when you start, get to work. If the starting time in your company is at 8.30, start at 7 calm. Now you say, where are you going to get the time? Get up a little earlier and get going. Remember, all you do is beat the traffic. If you get in there early and get in there, plan your day, get going, get organized, get started. When other people come in, you are already running, you're already on your way. Work through lunch. There's no law that says you have to go out and kill an hour, an hour and a half at lunch. Eat at your desk, eat quickly, eat on the go, use that time to work. Don't use that time to hang around. There's a thing sweeping America today about having fun at work. No, work is not fun time. Work is not the playpen or the sandbox. Work is not school. Work is work. What you do is you go to work and you work all the time. Don't worry about fun. Have your fun later, knowing that you've done a fantastic job and you've gotten a lot done. And finally, work one hour later. Be the last one to leave. Be the person who turns off the lights. Interestingly, if you look at an entrepreneurial startup, a business that's being run by somebody who's really driving it forward, you'll find that business owners usually are the first ones there, work through the whole day, usually the last ones to leave. Business owners usually work on Saturday and Sunday. At the end of the day, the business owners got a beautiful home, a house on the hill, beautiful cars, a beautiful life, vacations, a boat, a yacht, and everybody says, boy, she sure is lucky. No, they're not lucky. They just worked all the time. They work. If you work three extra hours, start earlier, work harder, day later, you'll add six hours of productive work to your day. Every hour of uninterrupted work when nobody's there translates into three hours of productivity when there's people around interrupting you. So, keep asking at work, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? And then do only that. And keep saying, back to work, back to work. Whenever you get distracted, or you start to follow the path of least resistance. I major in my mind or say, wait a minute, I've got to get back to work, back to work, back to work. Now the eighth discipline is the discipline of continuous learning. The rule is to earn more, you must learn more. If you want to earn more than you're earning today, you've got to learn new knowledge and skills that make it possible. Jim Rowan once famously said, work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your work. So, how do you do this? Well, you read in your field daily. If you reach 60 minutes a day in your field, a little in the morning, a little in the evening, it'll translate into one book a week. One book a week will translate into 50 books a year. The average adult reads less than one book a year, and most nonfiction books are never read past the first chapter. If you read 50 books a year, it's the equivalent of getting a PhD in your field every single year. Just reading every day will make you one of the most proficient, most skilled, and ultimately highest paid people in your field. Listen to CDs in your car, like this. The average person drives 500 to 1,000 hours a year. That's the equivalent of three to six months of a 40-hour week. That's the equivalent of one to two full-time university semesters. But listening to educational CDs in your car will make you one of the best informed people in your field. And finally, in continuous learning, attend seminars, take courses, take structured courses given by experts given by authorities. You can learn more in a half day or a day from an expert than you might learn on your own in years. I've had many people walk out of my courses with one new idea and increase their income five times within 30 days. One new technique for getting new clients, prospecting, one new technique for presenting or overcoming objections, one new technique for closing sales or getting referrals, and their income exploded. They'd have never learned it. They call me, they come to me, they say, it was incredible, it changed my life, that one idea. Now the average income in America increases about 3% a year. But with additional knowledge and skill, you increase the rate at which your income goes up. If you get new knowledge and skill, you learn more, your income goes up 10% per annum, you'll double your income in 7.2 years. If your income goes up 25% per year, you'll double your income in 2 years and 8 months. In other words, the more you learn, the more you earn. The benefits of continuous learning are life-changing. And here's the final one, the ninth discipline, the discipline of persistence. Now the discipline of persistence says that the greatest test of self-discipline is when you persist in the face of adversity and you drive yourself forward to complete your tasks 100%. The test of self-discipline is when you can drive yourself to keep on keeping on, even when everyone around you feels like quitting, and you feel like quitting as well. 
We say that courage has two parts. The first part of courage is the courage to begin. It's the courage to start. It's the courage to launch in the face of failure, with no guarantees of success. But the second part of courage is the courage to endure. It's the courage to persist and to keep on going when you're tired and you're disappointed and nothing's working, and there's no guarantee of success, and maybe even a very large likelihood of failure. So, it's really important. We say that your persistence is your measure of your belief in yourself and what you are doing. If you truly believe in the goodness and rightness and value of what you're doing, you will persist regardless of what's happening on the outside. And the more you believe in the goodness and rightness of what you're doing, the more you will persist, and wonderfully enough. The more you persist, the more you believe in yourself, and the more you believe in the value of your work. Persistence seems to change your character. In reality, persistence is self-discipline in action. In the final analysis, your persistence is your measure of self-discipline. Self-discipline leads to self-esteem. Every time you practice self-discipline, you feel better about yourself, which leads to greater persistence, which leads to even greater self-discipline. You get onto an upward spiral in life. That's why Napoleon Hill said that persistence is to the character of a man or woman, as carbon is to steel. You actually make yourself. You shape yourself. You form yourself. You build yourself into a superior human being, a better and stronger person, by persisting when you feel like quitting. Well, every time you have the tendency to quit, every time you feel like giving up or cutting corners or stopping before you finish your task, say, wait a minute, this is a test. This is a test of my character. This is the test to see what I'm made of. And it's not what I'm working on that counts. It's the person I am becoming by either persisting or quitting. So, always persist until you have completed the task. And as you do, you burst through, and your brain is flooded with endorphins, and you feel wonderful about yourself. Eventually, you develop that habit of persistence, and you become unstoppable. Here are the seven benefits of practicing self-discipline in every area of your life. The habit of self-discipline guarantees your success. Every single successful person has that fundamental quality of persistence and tenacity, that fundamental quality of self-discipline, to make themselves do what they should do, whether they feel like it or not. When you practice self-discipline, you'll get more done faster and better than other people. You'll get more results. You'll be more productive. You'll have higher levels of performance. You'll bring yourself to the attention of people who can help you, support you, and move you forward. You'll be paid more and promoted faster at any job, in any situation. The people with high levels of self-discipline who get results are the ones who are immediately moved to the front of the line of life. You'll have a greater sense of self-control, self-reliance, and personal power. You'll feel that you could do anything that you put your mind to, because you have the ability to make yourself, to discipline yourself, to do it anyway. Self-discipline is the key to self-esteem, self-respect, and personal pride. Every time you discipline yourself, you'll like yourself more. Every time you discipline yourself, you see yourself as a better person. Every time you discipline yourself, you feel great about yourself. You feel personally proud of yourself. It affects your personality in a very positive way. The greater your self-discipline, the greater your self-confidence, and the lower your fears of failure and rejection. Eventually, you develop self-confidence so that you'll walk through walls. With self-discipline, you'll have the strength of character to persist over all obstacles until you succeed. With self-discipline, you achieve personal greatness. All improvement in your life comes from changing your beliefs about yourself and your possibilities. Personal growth comes from changing your beliefs about what you can do and about what is possible for you. Would you like to double your income? Of course you would. Here's the question. Do you believe that it is possible? How would you like to triple your income? Do you believe that that is possible as well? Whatever your level of skepticism, let me ask you a question. Since you started your first job, haven't you already doubled or tripled your income? Aren't you already earning vastly more than you earned when you started? Haven't you already proven to yourself that it is possible to double and triple your income? And what you have done before, you can do again, and probably over and over if you just learn how. You simply have to believe that it is possible. Napoleon Hill said, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Perhaps the greatest breakthrough in the 20th century in the field of human potential was the discovery of the self-concept. Everything you do or achieve in your life 
Every thought, feeling, or action is controlled and determined by your self-concept. Your self-concept predicts your levels of performance and effectiveness in everything you do. It is the master program of your mental computer, the basic operating system. Everything that you accomplish in your outer world is a result of your self-concept. What psychologists have discovered is that your self-concept is made up of the sum total of all your beliefs, attitudes, feelings, and opinions about yourself and your world. Because of this, you always operate in a manner consistent with your self-concept, whether positive or negative. Here's an interesting discovery about the self-concept. Even if your self-concept is made up of erroneous beliefs about yourself or your world, as far as you are concerned, these are facts, and you will think, feel, and act accordingly. As it happens, your beliefs about yourself are largely subjective. They are often not based on fact at all. They are the result of information you have taken in throughout your life, and the way you have processed that information. Your beliefs have been shaped and formed by your early childhood, your friends and associates, your reading and education, your experiences, both positive and negative, and a thousand other factors. The worst of all beliefs are self-limiting beliefs. If you believe yourself to be limited in some way, whether or not it is true, it becomes true for you. If you believe it, you will act as if you were deficient in that particular area of talent or skill. Overcoming self-limiting beliefs and self-imposed limitations is often the biggest obstacle standing between you and the realization of your full potential. Albert Einstein was sent home from school as a young man with a learning disability. His parents were told that he was incapable of being educated. They refused to accept this diagnosis and eventually arranged for him to get an excellent education. Dr. Albert Schweitzer had the same problems at school as a boy. His parents were encouraged to apprentice him to a shoemaker so that he would have a safe, secure job when he grew up. Both men went on to earn doctorates before the ages of 20 and to leave their marks on the history of the 20th century. According to an article in Fortune magazine on learning disabilities in business, many presidents and senior executives of Fortune 500 corporations today were diagnosed in school as being not particularly bright or capable. But by virtue of hard work, they went on to achieve great success in their industries. Thomas Edison was expelled from school in the sixth grade. His parents were told that it would be a waste of time to spend any money educating him because he was not particularly smart or capable of being taught in anything. Edison went on to become the greatest inventor of the modern age. This kind of story has been repeated thousands of times. Self-limiting beliefs, sometimes based on a single experience or a casual remark, can hold you back for years. Almost everyone has had the experience of mastering a skill in an area where they thought they had no ability and being quite surprised at themselves. Perhaps this has happened to you. You suddenly realize that your limiting ideas about yourself in that area were not based on fact at all. Louise Hay, the writer, says that the roots of most of our problems in life are contained in the feeling, I'm not good enough. Dr. Alfred Adler said that it is the natural inheritance of Western men to have feelings of inferiority that start in childhood and often continue through adult life. Many people, because of their negative beliefs, most of which are erroneous, falsely consider themselves to be limited in intelligence, talent, capability, creativity, or skill of some kind. In virtually every case, these beliefs are false. The fact is that you have more potential than you could ever use in your entire lifetime. No one is better than you, and no one is smarter than you. People are just smarter or better in different areas at different times. According to Dr. Howard Gardner of Harvard University, the founder of the concept of multiple intelligences, you are possessed of at least 10 different intelligences, in any one of which you might be a genius. Unfortunately, only two intelligences are measured and reported throughout school and university, verbal and mathematical. But you could be a genius in the areas of physiospatial intelligence, art, design, entrepreneurial intelligence, business startups, physical or kinesthetic intelligence, sports, musical intelligence, playing musical instruments, writing music, interpersonal intelligence, getting along well with others, intrapersonal intelligence, understanding yourself at a deep level, intuitive intelligence, ability to sense the right thing to do or say, artistic intelligence, creating works of art, or abstract intelligence, physics, science. As the saying on the wall of an inner city school reads, God don't make no junk. Each person is capable of achieving excellence in some way, in some area. 
You have within you right now the ability to function at genius or exceptional levels in at least one and perhaps several different intelligences. Your job is to find out what it could be for you. Your responsibility to yourself is to cast off all these self-limiting beliefs and accept that you are an extraordinarily capable and talented person. You are engineered for greatness and designed for success. You have competencies and capabilities that have never been tapped. You have the ability within yourself right now to accomplish almost any goal you can set for yourself if you are willing to work long enough and hard enough to achieve it. The good news about beliefs is that all beliefs are learned. They can therefore be unlearned, especially if they are not helpful. When you came into the world, you had no beliefs at all about yourself, your religion, your political party, other people, or the world in general. Today, you know a lot of things, but as the comic Josh Billings once wrote, it ain't what a man knows that hurts him, it's what he knows that ain't true. There are many things that you know about yourself that are simply not true, and these are almost always in the area of self-limiting beliefs. The starting point of unlocking more of your potential is for you to identify your self-limiting beliefs and then ask, what if they were not true at all? What if you were possessed of an extraordinary ability in an area where you didn't think you were very good at all? Such as selling, entrepreneurship, public speaking, or money making. Everywhere I go throughout the world, I have taught these principles to many tens of thousands of people. I have filing drawers full of letters and emails from people who had never heard this idea of self-limiting beliefs before. But once they heard it, they changed their entire attitudes towards themselves. They began to see themselves as far more confident and capable in key areas of their lives than they had ever been before. In no time at all, they began transforming their lives and changing their results. Their incomes doubled and tripled and quadrupled. Many of them became millionaires and multimillionaires. They went from the bottom of their companies to the top, from the worst performer in their sales forces to the highest earning person in their companies. After they changed their beliefs about themselves and their personal potentials, they learned new skills and took on new challenges. They set bigger goals and threw their whole hearts into achieving them. By questioning their beliefs, and by refusing to accept that they were limited in any way, they took complete charge of their lives and careers, and created new realities for themselves. And what countless others have done, you can do as well. Imagine that there was a belief store, very much like a computer software store, that you could visit and purchase a belief to program into your subconscious mind. If you could choose any set of beliefs at all, which beliefs would be the most helpful to you? Here's my suggestion. Select this belief. I am destined to be a big success in life. If you absolutely believe that you are destined to be a big success, you will walk, talk, and act as if everything that happens to you in life is part of a great plan to make you successful. And as it happens, this is how the top people think in every field. How people look for the good in every situation. They know that it is always there, no matter how many reversals and setbacks they experience. They expect to get something good out of everything that happens to them. They believe that every setback is part of a great plan that is moving them inexorably toward achieving the great success that is inevitable for them. If your beliefs are positive enough, you will seek the valuable lesson in every setback or difficulty. You will confidently believe that there are many things that you have to learn on the road to achieving and keeping your ultimate success. You, therefore, look upon every problem as a learning experience. Napoleon Hill wrote, Within every difficulty or obstacle, there is the seed of an equal or greater advantage or benefit. With this kind of attitude, you benefit from everything that happens to you, positive or negative, as you move upward and onward toward achieving your major definite purpose. There's a law of reversibility in psychology and metaphysics that says you are more likely to act yourself into feeling a particular way than you are to feel yourself into acting. What this means is that when you start off, you may not feel like the great success that you desire to be. You will not have the self-confidence that comes from a record of successful achievement. You will often doubt your own abilities and fear failure. You will feel that you are not good enough, at least not yet. But if you act as if you were already the person you desire to be, with the qualities and talents that you desire to have, your actions will generate the feelings that go with them. You will actually act yourself into feeling the way you want to feel, by the law of reversibility. If you want to be one of the top people in your business, dress like the top people, groom like the top people, organize your work habits the way they do, pick the most successful people in your field, and use them as your role models. If possible, go to them, and ask them for advice on how to get ahead more rapidly, and whatever advice they give you, follow it immediately. 
Take action. When you start to walk, talk, dress, and behave like the top people, you soon begin to feel like the top people. You will treat other people like the top people do. You will work the way the top people work. You will start to get the results that the top people get. In no time at all, you will be one of the top people yourself. Maybe you've heard the saying, fake it till you make it. But there is a lot of truth to it. A friend of mine is a very successful sales manager. After he had carefully interviewed and then selected a new salesman, he would take the salesman to a Cadillac dealership and insist that he trade in his old car for a new Cadillac. The salesman would usually balk at the idea. He would be frightened of the cost of the car and the huge monthly payments involved. But the sales manager would insist that he buy the Cadillac as a condition of employment. What do you think happened afterwards? First, the salesman would drive the car home, and his wife would almost have a heart attack when she saw that he had bought a new Cadillac. But after she had settled down, he would take her for a ride around the neighborhood in the new Cadillac. The neighbors would see them driving in a new Cadillac, and as he waved on the way past, he would park his new Cadillac in front of his house or in his driveway. People would come over and admire it. Gradually, imperceptibly, at a subconscious level, his attitude toward himself and his earning potential would begin to change. Within a few days, he began to see himself as the kind of person who drove a new Cadillac. He saw himself as a big money earner in his field. He saw himself as one of the top performers in his industry. And time after time, almost without fail, average salespeople in this organization became sales superstars. Their sales performance jumped, and they earned more than they had ever before. Soon, the payments on the new Cadillac were of no concern because their incomes were so much greater. Emmett Fox, the spiritual teacher, once said that your main job in life is to create the mental equivalent within yourself of what you want to realize and enjoy in your outer world. Your focus must be on creating the beliefs within yourself that are consistent with the great success you want to be in your outer world. You achieve this by challenging your self-limiting beliefs, rejecting them, and then acting as if they did not exist. You reinforce the development of new, life-enhancing beliefs by increasing your knowledge and skills in your field to the point where you feel equal to any demand or challenge. You accelerate the development of new positive beliefs by setting bigger and more exciting goals in every area. Finally, you act continually as if you were already the person that you desire to be. Your aim is to reprogram your subconscious mind for success by creating the mental equivalent in everything you do or say. You develop new beliefs by taking actions consistent with those beliefs. You act as if you already believe that you have these capabilities and competences. You behave like a positive, optimistic, and cheerful person toward everyone. You act as if your success were already guaranteed. You act as if you have a secret guarantee of success and only you know about it. You realize that you are developing, shaping, and controlling the evolution of your own character and personality by everything that you do and say every single day. Since you become what you think about, you should only say and do those things that are consistent with your ideal self, the person you most aspire to be, and your long-term future ideals. You should only think and talk about the things that are moving you toward becoming the person you want to be, and toward achieving the goals that you want to achieve. Make a decision this very day to challenge and reject any self-limiting beliefs that you might have that could be holding you back. Look into yourself and question the areas of your life where you have doubts about your abilities or talents. You might ask your friends and family members if they see any negative beliefs that you might have. Often they will be aware of negative self-limiting beliefs you have that you're not aware of yourself. In every case, once you have identified these negative beliefs, ask yourself, what if the opposite were true? What if you had the ability to be extraordinarily successful in an area where you currently doubt yourself? What if you had been programmed from infancy with genius ability in a particular area? For example, what if you had within you right now the ability to earn and keep all the money you could ever want throughout your life? What if you had a golden touch with regard to money? If you absolutely believe these things to be true, what would you do differently from what you are doing today? Your beliefs are always manifested in your words and actions. Make sure that everything you say and do from now on is consistent with the beliefs that you want to have and the person that you want to become. In time, you will replace more and more of your self-limiting beliefs with life-enhancing beliefs. Over time, you will completely reprogram yourself for success. When this occurs, the transformation that takes place in your outer life will amaze you and all the people around you. Looking at the curtain which hides the blank screen as you wait for the featured picture to begin, what will this picture do for you? How will it affect you? 
All these feelings will pulse through you and more, for the picture you will see is about the most fascinating person in the world. Yourself. Can you watch the image upon that screen? Can you invent the image upon that screen right now? Will the story have a happy ending? But one realization can come comfort you. You can change the story as it unfolds. Now, this instant, and for your whole lifetime. You can make this a heartwarming story which will enrich the lives of all who know you, rather than a grab mechanical tale, a chronicle of boredom. It all depends on what you do with an image you carry inside you. An image which is your most important tool for good or for ill. It all depends on you and your self-image. The self-image is a product of past experiences, successes and failures, and the way other people react to you. From these factors and from others, you build up a picture of yourself which you believe is true. If it's a good, healthy, successful self-image, fine. But if it can stand some improvement, you can change it for the better and start getting the kind of results such a change will bring. Self-image determines the size and kind of person we become. We can remove our self-imposed limitations by enlarging our self-image. We form a mental picture of ourselves through experience, and we can change that picture the same way through experience. If the actual experience we need is not available to us, we can create that experience synthetically. An example of this synthetic experience. When a person worries about failure, he finds himself experiencing the same reactions that accompany actual failure, feelings of anxiety. As far as his mind and body are concerned, he has failed. Everything can be used in either of two ways, positively or negatively, constructively or destructively. But most people apparently never realize that positive results, just as real as the negative results of worry, can be achieved by using our imagination constructively. Instead of anxiety, thinking about confidence, self-assurance, poise, and the feeling of well-being would replace apprehension. By concentrating on the success he desires, by synthetically experiencing that success, he can expand the self-image instead of a person for whom success is normal. Use your spare moments to concentrate on your goals and the greatest success you seek. Analyze your past successes and formulate ways your success can be increased in the future. Put more into the positive use of your imagination than you ever put into its negative views. Worry, you're merely reversing the same creative process. Now, it's working for you instead of against you. All too often, almost unknowingly, we set the necessary limits for ourselves by holding a self-image that's restricted, inadequate for the full realization of our potentialities. Each of us is at this moment the product of all his thoughts and experiences and environment up to this point. Whether or not we choose to direct our own course through life is entirely up to us. The important thing is to know that it can be done. In the late Dr. Maxwell Maltz's book Psycho-Cybernetics, he wrote, Inferiority and superiority are reverse sides of the same coin. The cure lies in realizing that the coin itself is spurious. You are not inferior, nor are you superior. You are simply you. You as a personality are not in competition with any other personality, simply because there's not another person on the face of the earth like you. You are not like any other person. You're not supposed to be like any other person, and no other person is supposed to be like you. A human being is the finest, the noblest, the most godlike creature ever produced on earth. Not to be thankful for such a gift is the worst kind of ignorance, and an inferiority complex is a phantom, a ghost with no real substance. In the light of knowledge, it disappears. Of all the traps and pitfalls in life, self-doubt is the deadliest and the hardest to overcome, for it is a pit designed and dug by our own hands. We simply must get it through our heads that holding a low opinion of ourselves is not a virtue but a vice. Jealousy, for example, which is the scourge of many marriages, is nearly always caused by self-doubt. Dr. Maxwell Maltz's prescription for restoring your self-esteem, stop carrying around a mental picture of yourself as a defeated worthless person, Stop dramatizing yourself as an object of pity and injustice. You know the word appreciate literally means to appreciate the worth of. Why do men stand in awe of the stars and the moon, the immensity of the sea, the beauty of a flower or a sunset, and at the same time downgrade themselves? Do not downgrade the product merely because you haven't used it correctly. Don't childishly blame the product for your own errors, like the schoolboy who said, this typewriter can't spell. But the biggest secret of self-esteem is this. Begin to appreciate other people more. Show respect for any human being simply because he's a child of God, and therefore a thing of value. Stop and think when you're dealing with people. 
Practice treating other people as if they had some value, and surprisingly enough, your own self-esteem will go up. I think most people start out with a wonderful self-image, and then they're ground down quite often by their environment, and pushed into little rigid cubbyholes into which they're forced to work and live. The possibility of there being two human beings alike is so staggering, that it probably has never happened, and will never happen except in the case of single egg twins. Lewis Mumford has written that the great mass of comfortable, well-fed people of our civilization live lives of emotional apathy and mental torpor. When they go to sleep, they close their eyes and they dream of themselves as victorious knights riding out to do battle with evil. They wake up in the morning and forget everything. You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. We are not what we eat, but what we digest. You may be eating the best foods in the world, but if you do not digest them properly, the nutritive properties are not assimilated. Likewise, you may be exposed to the best ideas in the world, but if your mental digestive processes are impaired, they will not benefit you. The physician cannot write a prescription until he's made a diagnosis. As a person thinks, feels, and believes, Doe is the condition of his mind, body, and circumstances. A persistently superior attitude is the inevitable result of a persistent superior mental condition. When we realize that our present character, ability, and appearance are the result of our past habits of thought, it becomes an indication of the possibility of shaping the future character, ability, and appearance by directing our present habits of thought along definite lines.